Evening guys, uh, welcome to my first uh, ever live stream and um, my first episode of what you what amateurs can learn from the pros. And I'm, I'm privileged today to have a, a 2016 Olympic or well, Olympian from the Rio Games on my show. Well, my first show, and it's uh, really um, I'm really privileged. Um, I've managed. Well, I know Kerry from the ASICS front runner team and we're current members at the moment. So I'm gonna bring Kerry on. Thanks for coming on to uh, the episode, Kerry. Um, thanks a lot. Thanks and, for um, having you're, me. you're welcome. No, thanks for coming on. And you'll you'll be able to ask her questions on the comments box below and um, we'll, we'll, we'll get started now. So um, you've got a lot of uh, um, achievements. I've mentioned that you went to the Olympic games. Um, you've got 5K PB. Uh, 1557 and a 1500 meter PB of uh, four minutes 12. Um, talk me about your talk uh, well to us about your achievements and um, what you are most proud of. Yeah, well, I started off my running career as an 8 1500 meter runner, and uh, basically I was sort of more middle distance. But then I moved to the the steeplechase at the age of 30 because um, I was toying with the 1500 and the 5,000. Um, I wasn't quite speedy enough for the 1,500 to sort of make championships. I was maybe missing it by maybe a couple of seconds. And then in the in the 5K, I was again missing championship qualifying times by sort of maybe around 10 seconds, something like that. So I find that my sweet spot lay in the 3,000 meters um, and 3,000 meters is 3,000 meter steeplechase now um, for the outdoor track and field championships. And um, so that's how I made the move to to steeplechase. Um, but I tr I do train more like a five thousand meter runner with the amount of mileage I do, the types of sessions I do as well, the types of endurance sessions, and then um, I would also do a little bit of fifteen hundred meter racing, sort of to bring that speed in, sort of race speed for the three thousand meter steeplechase. Okay, um, that's quite interesting. So. Uh... Yeah, so you went from there on to um, a three k runner, and would you would you consider going longer, or you just um, you're quite happy with where you are? Yeah, well, um, recently with the whole pandemic over the last year, um, I suppose I have been running more miles, and um, some of my runs have become longer, and um, I'm sort of sort of getting a bit faster at the longer distances now. Maybe say if I go out for a ten mile run, I can be running sort of um, somewhere between. 6.30 um, and 6.45 minute mile in for a steady 10 mile run. Whereas before, you know, I probably would have sort of um, run about, you know, you know 7.30 minute mile in, something like that. So um, my speeds come on with my longer stuff, but um, I'm not too sure I could run a marathon. Sort of my long run on a Sunday is 14 or 15 miles. And by the end of it, sort of the last three miles, I get pretty tired. Um, so I sort of think, you know, halfway through, I think, oh, yeah, you know, I could train for a marathon. I could do a marathon. And then when I sort of put that long Sunday run and I think, no, I, I, I'm not too sure if I could go much past 15 miles, you know. Um, but, you know, never say never. You know, you never know. Maybe, you know, as, as a, you know, a couple more years tick by, you know, maybe I'll have a go some stage, sort of half marathon, see what that's like. And then then maybe tackle a marathon at some stage. But I would be very competitive. So I wouldn't like to just go into it just to, you know, run round or anything like that. I think it would be competitive and, and like to go for, for a time. So I probably would put in, you know, a, a good training block and be very, very competitive at that. Well, you're not, you're not far off it. I mean, you're not far... You said you're doing 15 miles, so you're not that far off it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> not, you're not that, yeah, not too bad. Well, you're nearly there. Um, so obviously, you've got these all these achievements. What was your, what is your favourite race? Is your favourite race the Olympics, or um, is it another race that's your favourite? Yeah, I guess my my biggest achievement, and and you know the sort of the one that sticks out is making the Olympic Games in in Rio, and uh, the qualifying race for that was in in Ireland in uh, Donegal in a place called Letterkenny. And um, that's where myself and another two Irish girls um, got the, the world and Olympic standard in 2015. So that's sort of the stick out race, you know, uh, getting the qualifying standard for Rio and, and the worlds in Beijing that year. And um, but really, yes, you know, the, the, the standout moment, you know, in, in my head race wise is walking out onto that Olympic Stadium, um, you know, with the heat blazing down in, in Rio and, you know, standing on that start line 
and um you know running the race and then you know finally coming across the finish line you know basically achieving you know a lifelong dream of becoming an olympian was something absolutely amazing um but if you're talking about other races you know the the armagh road race is a race you know that that's run here and it's it's become very very popular um internationally as well now um and that's one that's a road race that i've, I've always enjoyed um the, the men would run 5k and the women would run 3k around the the streets of armagh around the mall um and that's an exciting race as well but um it, it would be the rio, the rio olympics would, would stick out in my mind and, and be my greatest achievement uh, um, well, and we go back to Olympics. When you went, when you got there, and um, uh, obviously you you were so proud and everything. What um, did it feel like when when you actually competed? Do you feel like you wanted to go back again, or or did you feel like um, you've you've uh, com you've done everything you can? Yeah, well, I've been running since the age of 13. And um, when I sort of got to 18, 19, I'd sort of, you know, finished with age group athletics and I was going to university and my running sort of took a back seat. And it wasn't until sort of my mid 20s that I thought, you know, I really want to get back at this, you know, because, you know, I did have a talent. I am very competitive. So, you know, let's really have a go. Um, and then it was, you know, an extra, you know, handful of years until I realized, right, we'll, we'll give Steeplechase a go. So at the age of 30, you know, I gave steeplechase a go, um, and you know, I wasn't. It uh, wasn't until I was thirty-five that I made that that Olympics. You know, so I was um, I was 30, 34 when I got the qualifying standard, and and thirty-five at the Olympics. Um, so it really takes sort of it's really you know ten years in the making of a career to go from um, sort of running. Um, running as I was sort of um, internationally, you know, cross country and so on and making, starting to make championships like the Commonwealth Games and so on to then really putting in all those, all that groundwork over, you know, 10 years to then finally make an Olympics. So it, it's, it was a long time. And then you sort of think when you, when you get there, right, you've achieved your dream. Um, and you know, that, that at, at 35, that, that may be it. But I came across the finish line in Rio thinking, no, I definitely want more of this. You know, this is just, you know, I've got more hunger to come back again and try and run better. Um, and I suppose, uh, you know, uh, women in, in athletics, um, especially the, the endurance side of it, it's when you're in your sort of mid to late thirties where you are starting to to peak, and you can see some of those runners, um, especially the marathon runners that have gone into their their forties and competed well as well. You know that they have been running in their prime at their their early forties. Um, so I do want to give it another go, and you know that I, I definitely had Tokyo in my sights after Rio was finished. I thought, right, it's just another four year cycle. Um, I can do this again. I can come back even stronger and, and better. And um, you know, I'd, I'd I'd love to you know go to the Olympics twice. So Tokyo was sort of firmly in my sights, and then obviously last year the pandemic hit, and um, but for me it probably came at a good time because in September 2019 I was pushed in a race and um broke when I was hurdling. There's and actually a question that someone's oh, asked. Major injuries, oh, injuries. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so yeah so it was September 2019 I was in a race in Spain and I was pushed going over one of the barriers at, at the very start the first lap of the race and um, I broke my fifth metatarsal so um, I had to have surgery on it, a screw was inserted and then the following February of 2020 I had that screw removed and um, because it just it, the screw was supporting the brake but the brake had healed and the screw just didn't feel comfortable on my foot so the my surgeon decided we could take it out so um that was a big decision because it, it may have been then too early for me you know Tokyo 2020 and um, so then when the pandemic hit it was I, I could sort of ease back and not try and come back too quickly after that major injury and um, but that injury was the the most career threatening injury you know that that has has come about for me um, and, and it was really tough going you know having a surgery in September and then coming through to the next year and having to have a second surgery to get that screw removed and um, so that was that was really that was really tough but then with the pandemic it meant that you know i had that extra year to concentrate on my rehab fully and really not rush things and not rush the comeback 
So I've had a whole year of endurance under my belt, which is fantastic. I have had no niggles out of the foot that that was broken. It's now fully healed. The bone healed really well. And, you know, the foot's the foot's very strong. Um, so I've got I've got no problems with it. Touch wood. Um, so, so, you know, I guess the only thing now is the whole situation of lockdowns and not being able to travel. Um, so that sort of puts things, that makes things harder now for actually um, qualifying for, for Tokyo um, because I sort of missed that. Well, I, I guess a lot of people missed the 2020 season because the pandemic hit in March and everybody went into lockdown and then all races were cancelled. There may have been a few races popped up along the way during the summer, um, but you didn't have that track and field season that you would usually have and you didn't have the chance to sort of really go in there and uh, run for standards. So for me and a lot of other athletes, it's all come down to this year and what races we're going to be able to get and um, what races we're going to be able to get to as well um you know with 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 travel so um yeah everything's everything's up in the air but just i'm trying to stay positive and take each day as it comes and i guess no matter what happens um i've i've made the olympics before so i'll always be an olympian um it, it'll be a hard pill to swallow if i i don't make tokyo but um you know, I, I can't be disappointed. I really can't be disappointed because I've, I have had a fantastic career. Um, it would just make in Tokyo would be the extra icing on the cake, I guess the cherry on the cake in the end, you know, to make to make two Olympics. But well, I can't fingers, be <laughs> fingers, fingers crossed um, that you can make it. Um, we, we, you, you just said like with motivation, especially with COVID, um, there's a question here, how, how um, are you dealing with motivation, especially not knowing um, what, what the uncertainties around the world at the moment? How, how do you carry on? How do you stay motivated? Yeah, well, I guess last year um, when the pandemic hit and everybody went into lockdown, I was going through rehab. I just finished, come out of my second surgery on my foot. So um, I, I was rehabbing and I guess in a way it was a little bit hard. Um, I was going to be on my own anyway because I was, um, when I was able then to walk, I was doing a walk jog program to get back to running. So I wouldn't have been going out with my training partners anyway for runs. Um, so when that sort of finished and I was trying to get trying to get back running um, and we were in lockdown and you were only allowed out, you know, once a day to run for an hour and you're only allowed within, you know, certain mileage as well of your own home. I, I find that very hard because I'm in the country and I would need to travel um, an, an hour to get to a track. Um, I would maybe travel maybe 20 minutes to run around an ice lake or forest park. Um, so motivation was was quite hard at the start. And what helped me was talking to friends and family, you know, to really get me going again. And also um, chatting with um, my sports psychologist, Gary, Gary Longwell. And um, I'm supported through the Sports Institute in Northern Ireland. And I get to chat to Gary when I need to. Um, and he was fantastic for me at the start when my motivation was very low. Um, and it was, you know, sort of coming out of a second surgery and here we go again. We're having to start the rehab again. We're having to build up. up. We'll have to plan differently. And, and a part of it was very hard because then I couldn't see a physio either. So I wasn't too sure, you know, where I was with my foot because we weren't allowed to see physios or sports massage therapists. So I was having to gauge everything on my own. So I guess that's another reason why my motivation was low. Um, but chatting to Gary and one thing Gary got me to do was write, write lists. So not just put it on your phone or your iPad or your computer, but take a piece of paper and a pen and physically write down a list for the day. So it may have been you had to ha had to do five, you know, have five things you want to tick off during the day. Because what I was finding was I'd maybe go out and exercise, I'd come back in and I couldn't get motivated to go and do all my my drills and my extra exercises because I thought, you know, what's the point? There's nothing to work towards as in races and so on. Um, but Gary got me to write a list and tick things off as I went. And I guess that the mo that sort of motivated me. Um, if there was days where I was a wee bit low and I didn't get things done, um, you know, Gary said, just pick up the phone. I'd pick up the phone. He says, okay, let's discuss why you didn't get that done. 
um, and what you could have done to to try and do those things, you know, and try and get yourself motivated. But I really think chatting to people, especially people on the outside. So um, Gary was outside of my family bubble, outside of my friends bubble. And I think sometimes it's very easy to say to friends and family, on, you know, I don't feel like doing that. I don't feel like going for my run. I don't feel like doing the exercises. And they, most of the time they'll just say, well, that's fine. Whereas I find somebody on the outside of my sort of training and family bubble, you you were maybe saying no to them. You know, it was, it was, it was somebody looking on the outside and it was a different sort of conversation. Um, and I think, it's a really good um, way if, you, if you're on social media, maybe on Instagram, chatting to people who you sort of only know maybe through Instagram. So they're sort of a stranger, but you know them. But I, I think that's a really good way to motivate each other, you know, t talking to people that are maybe not in your day to day life that you see. Um, because I think sometimes it's it's. I think you just, I know like people would come to me if I put posts up about my rehab or my exercises and stuff or, or go, even going out in the rain and I would get a lot of people who don't know me personally but know me through maybe Instagram saying, oh, thanks for putting that post up. It got me out the door, you know? So I think sometimes if it's somebody on the on the outside or somebody that's, that's not your sort of day-to-day -day person that you're seeing, you're getting that extra motivation. Um, I, I get yeah it's just um I just find that it was just different you know speaking to somebody else um and then you know as as I got past my injury um I thought it was good um making sure that I was linking up with like one or two people during the week because it is really hard when you're training on your own to go out every single day and run on your own it, running can be a lonely sport and most of the time it is an individual sport and and we all do our own training sessions together most of the time but i find when i was meeting somebody at a certain time that was great motivation because i needed to get out that door at a certain time to meet that person so really having a having a running buddy or an exercise buddy um, and I know it's not possible now, you know, with, with lockdowns, we can only meet here, we can only meet one person outside to exercise. Um, so I do make sure I'm meeting up with somebody. Um, but then you could, you could easily then, you know, uh, one of our, our girls, um, Anya, does Zoom classes. Um, so knowing that she's sending through the Zoom classes, we're doing this at 12 or we're doing this at half one. Mm. Then you're, you know, you're linking onto Zoom. And it's that it's that interaction that you know you're 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 exercising with somebody else. So I really think sort of buddying up and doing some of the exercises or the runs with somebody else really sort of gets you out that door or gets you you know to to do the the bits and pieces that you know you might not do on in lockdown. You know you might just decide oh it's horrible outside. You know I'll I'll leave the run off to another day or something like that. But I think if you're if you're linking up with somebody or you know you know, organizing that you're you're doing the exercise with somebody else. It really sort of pushes you to make sure you're going to do it. Yeah, I, I think well, having other people around is definitely like um, a positive and especially with the clubs not around at the moment, they're not allowed to operate. It's a, it's a bit difficult, but I always find just getting out the door um, for just 10 minutes really helps um, and then I end up staying longer. Um, so let's move on. So that was really helpful um, to know an insight and what um so with your training, what what kind of mileage, typical mileage do you um you do a, a week? Um so I'm still in my sort of endurance block, you know, because there's been no races and, and we're not too sure of when races are gonna gonna pop up, especially you know, for the for the outdoor track season now. Um I have been still in my endurance block. So my endurance block, which would run through um the winter to, to now, um is about 70 to 75 miles a week. So that is structured with um, Monday would be a double day run, um, which would which would be maybe six miles in the morning and four miles in the afternoon and um, with a bit of gym work in the middle. And then a Tuesday would typically be a tempo day. So we may, for example, have um, eight, eight K of tempo float to do. So maybe one K tempo, one K float alternative. And that can be mixed up then, um, but, you know, the following week you might be doing two K on one, one K off and so on. And um, so typically te tempo on the Tuesdays and um, Wednesdays would then either be 
a double day or if I book in for a sports massage, I would do the the one run, which would be about sort of eight, eight to 10 miles. And then I would get um, a sports massage in the, in the middle of the week there. And then Thursday would be my 10 mile steady day um, where I'm going out and not running recovery, but not running tempo. So it's just somewhere in, in the middle of, of there, you know, so how, I, how slow, sorry, how, that, that's quite an important. I know a lot of people always say it like, um, you should run slow to get fast. Um, how slow would you run that run? Um, well, that that run, I classify that run as a steady run. Um, steady run. So a lot of my training, um, myself and my coach Richard, um, have, have worked with heart rate. So my typical recovery running heart rate would be an average about 135. So okay. for my steady run, I would then up that average to about 145 beats okay. um, for, for the steady run. So if I'm running my easy run around, say, 720 mileing, my from an easy run, my steady run is somewhere between, depending on the terrain and, you know, depending on if it's undulating or not, um, you know, I'd be running the steady run anywhere from um, six and a half minute mile into to 6.45. Um, but I tend to try and stick in my heart rate zones. You and know, would that, be zone, would that be like, would that steady would be zone two, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and then and then you know after steady, you know you've got your your fart like and our fart like would would um, mm. be be on a on a on a Saturday, and it's usually um fart like with some hill reps, some hill sprints, or fart like with some uh, fast flat sprints in between as well. If we're getting ready for for races or track season or so on, and yeah, something. I hate hill reps, but um, I, but they're, they're really um, they're really beneficial and satisfying when you do them. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll wait. I'll... They, they bring on the power as well. Um, so you know, it's 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 really good, and it's it's good if you can if you can handle it and you do it right. You know, it's it's really good for um your tendons, you know, your Achilles and so on as well, and um, strengthening everything up. No, it's, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many benefits. It helps with um your technique as well, doesn't it? Hill hill training. Um, so if, if you if you tend to overstride or heel strike. Um, hill sprints is very good as well because it's basically then sort of bringing your stride in a little bit and it's getting you to go on your toes as well. So yeah, and that and again, yeah, that will help with the technique. Um, so you do all that training. Do you do any cross training or is it just running? Um, throughout the years, I've tried to. So whenever an injury comes on or a niggle, then I've always cross trained. So I've used um, aqua running in the past. I've used cross trainers. I've used a stepper bike. Um, but usually I'm using the cr cross training when I'm injured or I've got a niggle and I do then always promise myself that I will incorporate that into my training just to offload a little bit but as soon as I start hitting then my 70 75 miles a week then you know it's a, th there's nothing like running to a runner um and if you put a runner in a gym and tell them to get on a cross trainer you know they just they just don't like it so at the moment, I haven't been doing any cross training, but if something, if I got a niggle or something came on, then I would offload the running and then I would, I would cross train. Okay. Um, do, do you do strength training or is that part of your cross training or do you just, um, do you do all the, would you do it all the time strength training throughout your program? Yes, I do. Um, I work with a guy, uh, David Roach, um, from Kilkenny, and David has basically put my um, strength program together. And basically, it's my strength program looks more at um, injury prevention and also, um, you know, stre strengthening the areas that that I need for for the steeplechase and basically, you know, for for my you know par for the event. So I don't lift heavy, heavy. My gym program is more of a maintenance program. So there's a lot of activation work. So a lot of band work. And um, there's also um, a lot of work uh, working on sort of um, sing single leg exercises as well. So single leg RDLs and so on. But I would just be like holding the likes of a, a kettlebell for that. Um, you can do so much with just one kettlebell, can't you? I, I learned that when I, when I bought one. And yeah, you can do so much with it. Mm -hmm. 
and it's just it's just really sort of you know so when when you run you know you're running you know when you land on a single leg you know you're putting so much force through that leg so you sort of really need to strengthen things up so my s and c program would look more at sort of glute activation and strengthening the glute and the hip areas and the sort of the the posterior chain as well and um, so any squats that i would do you know i wouldn't be squatting so, over over 50 kilos so not I wouldn't really be going over body weight um for for squatting um and um sort of hip, I would my only heavy would be hip thrusts you know because I am quite powerful from being a steeple chaser um and you know I can hip thrust about I think 110 115 kilos at, at max um but th that, that's max and that would be that would be winter um but really, I prefer to sort of I would I would stick around say the the, the 90, 90 kilos for for hip thrusts. Um, you know, as soon as you get that hip thrust technique, um, you know, you can hip thrust more and more. And I think hip thrusts um, and uh, glute bridges, you know, are are fantastic. You know, to strengthen the glutes and strengthen around that sort of hip area as well. Okay, uh, um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty basic program, and, and really, honestly, more about you know injury prevention, really, and not build not building muscle and so on. Uh, I think it's very important to do strength training, um, it because it, it, it keeps injuries away, and it, um, I think it makes you stronger. And therefore, if you get consistent training, you'll you'll get faster, or, or you'll hit your PB. Um, yeah, so it's really beneficial. Yeah, and um, I, I know if I do neglect it a bit, then the niggles start to come in. You know, for, for me, um, uh, calf raises are very, very important um, to keep my Achilles at bay and sort of also to sort of keep those tendons, you know, the, the post-tib tendon and so on, um, niggle free. Um, so calf raises every day and, and, you know, weighted calf raises too, you know, their calf raises are just the, the, bre the bread and butter of, you know, keeping those lower limb niggles at bay. Um, and uh, it's something I would do every single day along with the glute activation as well. If I was to neglect the other areas, it would be sticking to calf raises and um, the band work every day. That's good. And you know that you've got to keep on top of it. Um, mm -hmm. You don't get the niggles. Um, so, so you do all this training. Uh, do you have a full time job? I work part time as a supply teacher. So at the moment with the schools closed, um, I'm a full time athlete again. <laughs> but, um, you know, at athletics doesn't pay the bills. Um, I'm, I'm not funded. I'm, an, I'm a non funded athlete. And um, so, you know, I work part time as a PE teacher or teach other subjects, um, whatever the school needs me for. So um, it would just be a phone call or you might get a, a long maternity leave or something like that, or the phone would just ring in the morning and you would sort of have to chop and change and decide, right, well, I'll, I'll have to do my training in the afternoon or so on. But um, normally if I'm teaching and I'm on a double day, I am getting up early, I may be getting to the school um, well in advance and going for a run before school and so on. So um, I part-time part part teach and I'm also a, a massage, sports massage therapist as well. Okay, so you're able to you're able to um, work around work anyway. So um, that's yeah. that's, pre that's pretty good. And there's a question here: did, What is your favourite type of training session? Um, I really like the the tempo training sessions at the minute. So um, I discussed there earlier that um, one of my favourite sessions is um, uh, eight eight k. Uh, and it's 1K tempo, 1K float, 1K tempo, 1K float. Um, so the, the float would be run at about 10 beats below, uh, 10 beats below your heart rate, what uh, you're running your tempos for. Um, so it could be around 20 seconds a mile slower for the for the floats compared to the tempo. But the alternate, the alternate K tempo and, and K float for, for 8K, that's one of my favorite sessions at the moment. Okay, so that sounds quite a tough session. Yeah. Um, got another question here. Uh, what is your favourite post-run snack? Oh, it's from my wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love my snacks. Um, after every single run, um, I take um, Enhanced Recovery Sports Drink. 
Um, and it's it's a protein drink and it's like a really, it's a lovely raspberry, strawberry flavor. It's got 20 grams of protein, 25 grams of carbohydrate in it, but it's also got fresh omega-3, but don't worry, you can't taste the omega-3 in it. Um, so the, I would have one of those, you know, st straight after every every run or every workout, um, basically, that so I know within my 30 minute window, post-exercise, I'm getting the right amount of protein and carbohydrates that, that I need. Um, but I love chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, I've had a sweet tooth recently. I've had to cut it out because I keep raiding the cupboards for sweets and I've got to try and stop. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm terrible. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to stay off it now. Um, and, I, and, I, and I will in the next week or so once this, once the chocolate's out of the house, I'll stop. But when I come back, um, when I come back from my run every day, um, the 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 meal I like to prepare is toasted brioche bap with avocado, mushrooms, chorizo, and a fried egg. <laughs> nice, that's a different. I like, I like mixing. Mix. <laughs> And obviously, you you have so you have all, you you do all this running. You've got your favourite pre snacks and stuff. But how much time do you actually spend on your recovery and your nutrition? That, I think that's someone's asking. That's quite an important uh, factor because you do you do seventy five mile weeks and you, mm -hmm. and then you do strength sessions and you and do teaching as well. Um, so how much do you focus on the recovery as well and your nutrition? Yeah, well, for the for the nutrition, because I'm running so many miles, you know, I've I've always um, I've always eaten what I've wanted to, you know, sort of um, everything in moderation. So I don't really deprive myself of anything, you know. If I if I want that ch that chocolate bar, I'll have the chocolate bar and and, and so on. And um, but in in that thirty minute window after well, it, this like, is just a bowl of ice cream. You've made him it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope he had chocolate on it as well, ice cream with chocolate and a bit of muesli. Um, but yeah, I, I always make sure I have something within that 30 minute window post exercise, you know. Uh, so basically, you know, your your glycogen stores are are, are topped up again and, and so you are recovering and your your stores are getting topped up so you're gonna be able to run the next day. Um but you know, I do, I do make sure, you know, I get the the fruit and veg and I need um I suppose like any runner, like carbs would be, I would always probably think of the carbs first, you know, whether I'm having sort of potatoes or whether I'm, you know, whatever car pasta or whatever carbs I'm going to have. And then I decide after that, you know, whether I'm going to have meat or fish or, or something, you know, so I'm always thinking of the carbs and um, we always have bread in the house, but maybe that's a big Irish thing, having your spuds and your bread in the house. <laughs> but uh, no, I, I eat well. I have my sort of my, my, my breakfast, my lunch and, and my dinner. And, and in between, I, I do do a bit of snacking and, and usually maybe with a protein drink or maybe a cereal bar or something like that um, or coffee and a chocolate bar. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and recovery wise, you know, as well, I make sure I'm getting one massage a week. I maybe check in yeah. with the physio at the sports institute once every two to three weeks just to make sure you know maintenance wise um and then you know i would use um recovery boots as well from time to time if i've had a really tough session i'd put the compression recovery boots on and use those um and do also you find that they, they, they help do you find they help or I do. Um, I first used those. Um, it was at the European Championships in 2016. Um, I used the recovery bits. There was a, a guy there from the Netherlands and he had the recovery bits there that you could use in between heats and finals. And, and that year, myself and, and another two of the Irish girls had made the steeplechase final. Um, so we'd gone in and had the ice baths and so on and the recovery bits were there to use. Um, I used the recovery bits um, and you know, I thought that they were great. You know, I I ran um sort of the exact same time in the heat and and, and the final. I think it was nine forty five both times. Um, so I was sort of sold on them back then. Um, and then I contacted the guy and bought a pair off him. Um, so I have been using them, but I don't overuse them because I do think you can sort of get to the point where you maybe overuse something and then you're sort of on a on a plateau that, um, something doesn't help you as much as it did. Um, so I would only maybe use them maybe once a week. Um, yeah, I, I find the same as well. When I when I um, first used them, my physio allowed me to use them at his place. And I did a hill session, and uh, normally the following day my legs were in bits, but they were fine after it. But then I found 
um, I ended up buying a pen. I found that when I um, used them more and more, they did. They, I didn't recover as quick, so I, I don't use them as often. But very much like similar to what you you said. So because um, they just they they sort of stimulate the blood flow, so it's the extra blood thro- flow through you know the muscles. So you know if you've had a hard session that you have been filled with lactic, then you know they're they're great for basically you know getting the blood circulating around and basically you know trying to flush that lactic out. Um, but as I say, you know, and yourself, you know, if you use something too much, you sort of, you know, your body doesn't respond as much to it. Um, so, you know, I do, I probably would use them more come track season and when I'm on the track and then sort of not so much in the in the winter time, you know, when I'm sort of doing more mileage, it's when I start doing this, the speed stuff or the lactic sessions that I want to flush the legs out, I'll use them. Um, I would have Epsom salt baths as well. Oh, okay. Um, I find them great, especially, you know, when you sort of get that that bit older <laughs> and, and you're you're getting up from sitting down or driving and you're you're sore and you're stiff. Um, I find that, you know, more so um, my body like sort of the, the heat and the heat of the bath with the Epsom salts rather than maybe applying ice to something. Um, I always say there's a time and a place for ice, you know, if you do have an injury or you need to get a bit of inflammation down, yeah, ice ice is brilliant and ice baths are good, but more so um, my body quite likes, um, the, you know, the hot the hot baths. Um, so I find find that very beneficial as well. Um, and, you know, your foam rolling and your your massage guns as well. Um, you know, I really think, you know, during, during, especially during lockdown there when you weren't allowed to see physiotherapists and the yeah. massage gun was so beneficial back then yeah i think i think any sort of recovery tools are really beneficial just not to use them too often but um mm-hmm. yeah i do think they are there there's a question here um it sounds like you where well, you've got a busy schedule but do you have any uh rest days and what do you do on them yeah um again rest days i would tend to leave rest days um for when I am feeling really tired or maybe a bit unwell or I've got a few niggles going on or I've done enough mileage for the week that, you know, I, I can take a rest day. Um, but rest days, I would maybe have one rest day once in a blue once in a blue moon. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's because in the past I've sort of had, um, you know, sort of, you know, tight calves and Achilles and my tendons always like loading my tendons don't like to be offloaded um, and I find that when coming back from an injury or coming back from end of season break where you do take say 10 days to two weeks off and as soon as I come back my Achilles are screaming at me because they've been offloaded and they haven't liked that you know so I try and sort of keep even if it's just walks or something like that um, but I would make sure I, I'm always a big believer in active recovery um, so if it is a day off, I would still get out and walk the dogs, you know, for at least two miles and, uh, you know, get the fresh air and sort of, you know, slow the body down, but still be active. You know, um, I just I'm a big believer in active recovery um, because if I did sit about the house and just lounge about all day, I would get very stiff and then I would find the run the next day much harder. But like there's days where I have, you know, um, especially coming back from the injury, um, I got out in the bike and I would maybe do maybe say sort of 10 to 15 miles on, on the bike, just not pushing the bike or anything, you know, and it's just just a it's just a, a mountain road bike and, you know, just going out and just, you know, getting into a good head space and, you know, just taking in the countryside as it cycles along and, and not really push things. Uh, it sounds nice. I mean, where I've seen the pictures where you live, like uh, the roots are, are beautiful. And, and I, I agree with what you said about the Achilles. I had an Achilles injury um, back in 2013 and I rested it for three months and it didn't do anything to it. I had to keep loading it. Um, yes, I totally um, agree with that. Um, yeah, it's like to be loaded. And uh, what I find as well, you know, with gym work, isometric holes. So holding and maybe having a bit of a bit of weight on your shoulders and basically being up on your toes and holding sort of single leg holes and um, so isometric work is fantastic for tendons and that's what's helped me um with my tendon issues over the years is it's those isometric holes yeah you just got to keep keep loading it and um i mean i feel it now and again but um it, yeah i do that sort of stuff and it and it helps um there's uh one here it says, I think we've touched on it briefly. Uh, 
do, do you find that weekly massages help? Yeah, definitely. You know, there's there's only so much you can do yourself, you know, foam rolling. Um, I'm a sports massage therapist myself and, um, you know, you can maybe get into your calves a little bit, but, you know, really sort of, you really, you, you don't have the strength really to, I don't really want to call it inflict pain on yourself, but um, I think sometimes, you know, when you, when you have got those tightnesses, you know, if, if you're running and running and running constantly um, and you're maybe not getting a massage, then things really tighten up. And I find if I get a massage once a week, um, it, you know, it's really helping and, and I'm, I'm able to then, it, it, it is keeping the niggles at bay. You know, it's, it's, I would get very tight calves um, and just having somebody, you know, to, to, to listen them out or even for somebody to even pick up, oh, you've got a wee knot there that you maybe didn't know about. Um, I really, massage has really benefited me over the years and it's something that I really invest in, you know, so, so once a week, you know, I'm making sure, um, I'm getting, getting the massage, um, again, um, you know, I'm paying that myself as well. Um, but you know, it's an investment that I know, um, is going to benefit me rather than, you know, you could go weeks and weeks without a massage and then next of all, a niggle turns into an injury and you're forking out lots of money for a physio. Whereas if you had a page or, you know, 30 pounds a week to get your sports massage, you could have, you know, avoided it. Um, so I really do think sports massage is very, very beneficial. Yeah, I, I think it is as well. I, I think it, and it helps with recovery. Um, as Chris has said that he's, uh, his Achilles was fixed by wearing uh, Nikes. <laughs> so um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so ne next one is, uh, so next question. So um, you were... Um, you, you, uh, when you were growing up and you were, were running, um, what, who was your uh, hero and um, well, what made you want to become like an athlete? Yeah, I guess I just, I guess I just fell into running um, sort of when, when I was growing up and on the, on the TV athletics wise, it was sort of like the, you know, you had the Kelly Holmeses, you had the Sonia O'Sullivan's, um, you know, all, all those guys running. Um, and I guess at the time, because we didn't have athletics in primary school, you had your sports day once a year. Um, but we didn't have athletics in primary school like they they would have now. Um, so it wasn't until secondary school that um, there was a bit of cross country and I got into cross country in, in secondary school. And then there was a, a, a local race um, in my hometown, Newcastle, County Down. And uh, it was a there was a three k for juniors and a five k for seniors on the road, and I just asked my dad, "Oh, can I run this race?" And he was like, "Yeah, okay." And and that's how I got into running because I ran the race and I beat most of the boys. I think there was maybe only two boys in front of me, and um, it was the local club then that said to my dad, "You know, she should come and do a few training sessions." So I would link up with the local club once a week and it was all seniors there wasn't any juniors in the club um and i would run with them once a week and then in between that i was doing a little bit of running at school um so sort of growing up you were watching the athletics on the tv but you never thought you could do that yourself you know it was it wasn't there was no like nowadays you've got um sort of uh, role models coming into schools and um, sports personalities and, you know, all the kids are sort of looking up to them and, and wanting to be like them, maybe, you know, the footballers, the, the runners and so on. Um, but sort of back then there wasn't sort of um, the school visits from anybody except sort of local um, Gaelic football players, maybe when, you know, the, maybe the, the one, the county championships that they'd maybe come in with the trophy. Um, and again, back then it was mainly um, male footballers, you know, there was no female footballers back then. So I guess, you know, to be inspired by, you know, there's lots of female Gaelic footballers now that are they're going in and inspiring young girls to to get involved with Gaelic football or other sport other sports, um, which is which is absolutely fantastic, um, but I guess sort of you know starting my running career and I, I really looked up to Mary Peters. Mary Peters was a great supporter of mine, and um, there was a there's a Mary Peters Trust. And the Mary Peters Trust um, invests in young athletes and gives out bursaries. So it may be something like, you know, £500 given out to so many so many athletes, um, all different types of sports people. And um, so Mary is somebody who I've looked up to, um, somebody who invested in me um, with a bursary and believed that I could go to the Olympics. So, you know, having an Olympic gold medalist believe in you and 
sit down and chat with you. And like Mary, Mary and I went for lunch one day, um, and it was um, coming up to London 2012, and I was trying to make London. And um, you know, she was she was so inspirational, and just sitting down and having that chat with her, um, it was she's just she's just amazing. Um, now I got an Achilles issue then coming up to qualifying for London 2012 and I, I didn't make it you know but you know she always said no next time round is going to be your time you know it'll be your time next time and so on and just having you know having somebody to look up to that way and somebody who really believed in you and and uh, could see in you your your drive and your determination and so on and um sort of really give me that push as well you know again somebody outside of the training bubble um and somebody that didn't really know me personally until you know we got to meet each other and um, I did a bit of um, work with Mary as well chatting to the younger athletes of today you know I would link up with Mary every so often um, and um, tell the younger athletes my story um, and uh, you know the Mary Peters Trust has been fantastic for for young sports people in Northern Ireland it's just been just been great and so I guess you know she has been somebody who I've looked up to um, and uh, hopefully, hopefully I can make Tokyo because she went to Tokyo as well. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. I, mean, it, it, I mean, I've been on the track and there's been like um, uh, uh, Olympian training or a GB athlete training there and they, and they, they fly past you. But um, it actually, I, I feel it always make, it spurs you on and makes you feel like you're, um, it makes you want to try a bit harder. But um, sometimes I feel when you're on it, you feel privileged that if someone there training and, and I think you're right like we're saying just having the, like the presence um of someone there I mean it actually does lift the spirit a bit um yeah so that is a um a question regarding racing uh what's it like where when you get el well elbowed in a race situation and you've got to try and get yeah. position well it's it's pretty tough and steeplechase as I learned in 29th September 2019 when I was actually pushed from behind <laughs> Um, so steeplechase is quite tough because um, if the race is packed, everybody's then wanting an inside line. So when it comes to running at the barriers, what you usually find is that we spread out a bit to basically hurdle the barrier each time. And then we're all coming back in together to run the inside line again on the track. So steeplechase you've not not only got sort of elbows out but you've got you know a, a lead leg and a trail leg and sometimes if two people are um hurdling with the opposite trail leg trail legs can you know catch each other um or if you've seen some of the african athletes hurdle they'll go over with two legs to the side sometimes so it's it's really really tough in steeplechase because not only do you have to sort of concentrate on your race and your cadence and you know run into the best of your ability but you've also got to watch out for danger in the steeplechase um so so that's pretty tough but you've also got to watch out that you don't get disqualified as well that you actually you know don't intentionally um push somebody out of the way or elbow somebody out of the way that a track official will see you and and you get disqualified so um but i guess you know start lines especially in cross country it's always you know i suppose you hear some coaches shout you know elbows out you know to, to get your position to you know to to get a good good start on the line um but i guess you know with the um races like the longer races you know cross country and um those other you know sort of longer races you know without hurdles to negotiate um once you're in the race you're in the race um i guess that's why i've always liked road racing because once you get out in the road you're just sort of free out in the road and there's 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 not any jostling or anything like that um but yeah i guess you know steeplechase is tough because it's it's technical but you've also got to watch out for danger and and, and what happens if things go wrong like um during a race uh, ha, um and, and things gone wrong and then you've able you've you've actually able to chain flip it over during the race and it's it's got better than well better than you thought it would have done yeah well in in steeplechase sort of you know as you know anything can happen um it was the world championships um that i was running in, in beijing and um, when one of the other competitors she actually took sort of a dive bomb behind me and 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 actually w went full into the water um now i was unaware that that had happened but there you know there's a famous photograph of it and um 
you know, I, I was quite lucky that she didn't actually catch me from behind. But sometimes if somebody falls in the water jump, they can catch you and you, you'll fall as well. And it's happened to so many people. And I guess you've just got to you've got to gather yourself. And sometimes there's so much adrenaline running through you that you maybe would then try and run too fast and maybe catch up with the group. Whereas you're better just sort of composing yourself and making your way back to the group gradually. And um, because, you know, sort of too much adrenaline running too fast, then the lactic spikes and then you're treading water before you know it. Um, steeplechase is pretty hard. It's the last kilometer, really. You know, you get through two kilometers of racing and it's that last kilometer where you can be swimming and the barriers can feel like mountains to get over. And, you know, you've just, you've really got to dig deep. Um, and when you hurdle barriers, you run fast into them to hurdle them and then you run fast out of them. Okay. So if you are slowing down and you're flooding with lactic, if you're coming to a barrier and nearly stopping before you jump over it, you know, you're wasting more energy. Um, so the last kilometer is really, really hard. And that's why I would train more like a, a 5K, even a 10K runner where sessions are concerned, you know, so when we're talking about doing 8K of volume in a session, it's to set up my endurance. It's basically to build my endurance blocks. So I have all the endurance in the world for that last kilometer. And then my track sessions, you know, maybe 20 by 400 or so on would start to bring in my speed when it comes to track. Um, but, you know, when, th when things go wrong in the steeplechase, it's pretty hard. You know, when that bell goes and you know, you know, you've got five more barriers to jump along with the water jump. Um, it can be it can be pretty tough. Um, and you've just got to you've just got to, you know, grit your teeth and go. <laughs> well, it sounds really, really tough. So yeah. So people will be watching this and they'll be thinking that there's, there's a lot of people that since COVID have taken up, um, taken up running. What, what advice would you give them if, uh, if they're just taken up running? Yeah, well, if you've just taken up running, you know, first and foremost, make sure you're in the right pair of shoes. Um, there's so many people would maybe choose a pair of shoes either on price or how they look, you know, if they're, you know, flashy shoes, if they like the color or so on. It's really, really important to know whether you are a heel striker, a, a midfoot striker, a forefoot striker, whether you overpronate um, or whether you have high arches. Um, it is so, so important to be in the right shoe for you. Um, so that would be the first bit of advice. Um, and the next bit of advice is not to overdo it to make sure you've got a, a plan. And maybe if you're only starting out, you know, walk jog is very, very, is a very, very good way of starting out, you know, and, and not loading the body too much. And then maybe bringing in a wee bit of cross training or days where you're maybe just going for a walk to give yourself a little bit of break and not, not bring things in too fast. I think during lockdown, a lot of people started running and were enjoying it so much then they would go out running every day or build up their mileage. Or what I find where we train at a lake, there were some guys went to run a lap of the lake and then the next day the train run it faster and the day after that run it faster and faster and faster. Rather than, and then we had, a myself and my coach had a discussion with the guys because they were asking asking us how fast we would run a lap of the lake in and so on. And, and we discussed with them how um you would you know do different training sessions to become faster and not just go out and run a, the same loop to try and get faster but you would break your session into tempo running and tempo float and fart lick and so on or and hill sprints and things um and it's quite funny now because every every week you would see them on strava and they wait till we do our session and they check the boys strava and then they're replicating our session <laughs> <laughs> so it's great, it's great to see that they you know they're sort of they're following suit and they're um they're, they're seeing what we're doing and they're actually now and and it's it's mostly footballers um because they can't train train together or anything and um, so the, so those guys are going out and it's great to look at their Strava and see that they're they're, they're coming on leaps and bounds um but it's really great that you know that we're we're the trendsetters now for the sessions and uh you know we, ha we have a bit of a, a laugh about it as well you know it's, it's great to see and we'll compare what we've done to what they've done and um I think actually a few of the footballers now have got so good at the running that um they're talking about not going back to football as well they're talking about you know sort of taking the running seriously now well, um, which is great Right, yeah. yeah going back to Strava I'm, I'll ask you a few more questions and I won't keep you much longer but um, I was having a debate with a friend the other day and he, he thinks that Strava is a bad thing because people um, will, will go on Strava and look what other people are doing and they'll think 
I, I can do that. Why don't I try that? But what, what do you think? Is it a bad thing or a good thing to have Strava? Yeah. Well, I am personally not on Strava. So what the guys have been doing is they go and look at my training partner Strava and they will the wow. copy our session from, from him, you know, because they know he, he trains with me. Um, so Connor would put up his Strava session and we'd do the Strava set. He would do the session on a Saturday. And then on a Sunday, we would see that, you know, some of these guys have, have copied the session. But um, yes, I do think Strava um, can be the devil. <laughs> Because I would be, I was out running um, with the guys um, before we had this lockdown when we we're only allowed to train with one person. Um, so, so in the winter there, we were running um, in, in the town and we'd be doing our session. And I would be running along with the boys. And then next of all, at the end of a session or in the middle of a session, somebody would just put the boot down and take off. And I would be like, what is going on? So I asked one of the girls when we'd finished, I says, uh, oh, everything was going well. We were all running together. I says, but then your man just put the boot down and he was away. And I says, and she says, oh, that's a segment. And I was like, what? What do you, what do you mean? I, so I wasn't down with, this, with the Strava lingo. So when there's, a, when there's a segment and you're doing a session, the boys were taken off to basically get the segment, to get their crimes as such. Um, which was a totally bad idea because you were supposed to be running at a certain tempo or a certain speed. And then all of a sudden they would put maybe like sort of like a fart lick in. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think if I was on Strava, I would get very competitive. So, you know, if, 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 I, if I owned a certain loop and somebody went and took that loop, then, you know, I would, I would find it very hard then to be out the next day and not try and get that loop back. As such um and then you know it if you're supposed to be out for an easy run but you're thinking you know i need to get my segment back or you know i need to get this loop back you know it it, it gets very competitive um it has been great in some ways you know because it's given people sort of that competitive edge where yeah. there hasn't been competition because of the pandemic but um i think if i was on it i would be far too competitive <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I do think it is a bit lethal. It can be lethal. Um, we got two more questions, and then we went. We we have a wrap. Um, there's one here that says, "What what's your favorite? Um, what's your favorite thing about running?" Um, I think it's it's basically all the friends that I've made over the years. It's it's crazy how many friends I have in different countries around the world. Like running has given me the opportunity to um, go to major competitions around the world. You know, I, I went to Beijing for the World Championships, Rio for the Olympics. Um, I've traveled the world altitude training in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I go to font Romeu in France as well. Um, but the people you meet along the way, um, is, is amazing it's one big family and I think sort of running and athletics as a sport yes it's competitive but there's um there's just that real sort of um link between runners there's just everybody supports everybody um it's it's just one of those sports that sort of brings everybody together of all shapes and sizes and abilities it's just it's just fantastic so it is but i think it definitely is sort of the the friends i've made like even through um the asics front runner program um like meeting you guys as well from different you know different sports where bet me be it triathlon or ultra running or trail running and um, myself on the track some of the road runners um you know i wouldn't have met you guys you know if it hadn't been for the for the asics front runner program um and you know i have friends all over the world that you know I, I wouldn't have met if it hadn't have been for running so it definitely is definitely is the friendships definitely yeah i mean from i've enjoyed traveling being able to travel around the world yeah and meet, meeting people like yourself who inspire me and um yeah it's just a, it's amazing i think it's just a, a lovely community um so I wanted to ask you one question, and there was another one that's just come through. Um, no, you're all right. <laughs> no, no more questions after. No more questions, guys. Um, so the first one, what? Well, what would you, if you were to go back to your younger self, what would you do differently now? Oh, um, what would I do differently now? Gosh, that's a hard one. I wasn't expecting that. 
Um, Sorry. <laughs> oh, I think I think it would probably be the sort of when when we were all younger, we sort of didn't have sort of all those activation exercises, you know, mm-hmm. sort of all the exercises that can keep all the all the niggles at bay. So, you know, if I if I had known about you sort of the band work and the glute work, you know, beforehand, then maybe, you know, in my earlier years, I wouldn't have had so many injuries. You know, I was always sort of, you know, when I was younger, I was always having Achilles injuries, sort of calf problems and so on. Um, I had a few stress fractures, but I wouldn't have done the sort of the, the activation work um, that marries along very, very well with with running these days. Um yeah, and I guess sort of, I would have thought, you know, sort of le- less is more and um, really, oh gosh, yeah, you've got me. <laughs> right, we'll move on then. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's quite hard. I, I always, because I didn't do any anything when I, when I was a kid, I just did um, athletics at school and, and uh, I hated it. And um I I I went, I started running when I was 29, so um, mm-hmm. I always regret that I started later in life and I wish that I started before. But um, you can't change the time, can you? But um, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's. It, I would have, you know, even you know, kids these days, you know, I'd say to them, you know, try 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 everything. Um, there was no athletics in in primary school for us. Um, you know, I I didn't start steeplechase till till I was 30. Um, and you know but you know kids should try every single sport going because you know even if they're they're not good at something there, there's some there's always a sport that that somebody can do or somebody's good at you know um because I, I know there's some people that say you know I, I don't like sport at all but I don't fully believe that you know there's something for everybody may it be just walking or or cycling or even if it's bowls, you know, um, they're definitely there's there's something for everybody in sport. Um, so you know, I would just say, you know, have have a go at everything. Um, because you never you never know. You know, you may be the next Olympian at you know a water sport or whatever it may be. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, I know people from the running club that um, have started off in their fifties and and they've been and they've been really quick runners. And you and you do think like. If they started younger, um, yeah, it's a talent that you don't realise that they um, they had. Anyway, the last question, final one. Um, my daughter's getting into running, age thirteen. When should she join a club and get serious? Yeah. Well, I guess it, I guess it's hard at the moment, um, because you know clubs aren't in operation at the moment until you know some of the the lockdowns get lifted. Um, but yes, definitely joining a club. Um, I know you know there's loads of clubs. Um, over um over in uh england and, and and like there's loads of clubs isn't there um yeah, it's, it's, it's you know it would be the the british athletics website you know you would you would go on to um and have a look and it would have the list of the clubs and over here in northern ireland and and uh, the um athletics northern ireland and athletics ireland have websites where you can go in and you can look and you can find your local club. So I guess yes, look and see what your local who who your local club are. Um, that they usually have their own websites. And um, they usually have up when training nights are. Um, and I think it, it is important to yeah start start the club because it's really hard for you know a thirteen year old to go out and run on their own or train on their own. But if they're going out and they're they're running with you know other kids the same age, it's so much easier. There's, it always has to be fun. I think at that age, you know, if you're not having fun, you know, it's it's sort of there's no there's no point, you know, if if you're really not enjoying it. And I, and I think the enjoyment at that age comes with you know joining other kids and and doing the training, you know, with other people. Um, and then the club coaches will will keep you right that way as well you know of, of how much to do and how much you know you should be doing and shouldn't be doing um what other aspects you you can bring in sort of drills and things um and they can also give advice on again the the shoes and the type of gear to wear um and then your club can 
uh, point you to different races and things that may be coming up there's lots of age group races you know in a normal year and um, you know so you've got your cross country seasons your track seasons and so on um, and then the club can keep you posted of of which races and stuff are coming up so I do think it is important to to get involved in a club um, and sort of really um, get that knowledge from the coaches but then also the seniors in the club as well because there will be people for for the kids to look up to and so on okay that's that's a good answer yeah I, I, definitely you can go onto the like the website and see websites and see like british athletics and um yeah i think the club um beneficial but you have to find the right club don't you really where you think you can because i know some clubs most clubs have junior sections now but maybe some clubs maybe don't have um junior sections i know my club um newcastle ac um, we were mainly a senior club um, and then um, some of the parents got together and established the junior club um, and we, we are so inundated with the junior club that there there's actually a waiting list to then get into the junior club for training nights because um, obviously the facilities and the number of coaches we can only you know take so many children per night um, so you know it's it's really really popular but um like we were predominantly a mountain running club to start off with um, oh, okay. and that's, that's somewhere where i started as well so i as, as well as across country i started on the mountains um and it's sort of only recently now over the past number of years we have a junior section in the club and we've also you know all, all the rest of the runners are branching out to to road running and marathon and um there's only a handful of us that do track maybe me and maybe maybe three or four other boys do the track um hopefully you know as we get the juniors progressing up the ranks into senior we'll have more kids on the track because you know now there is so much more for children and athletics where there mightn't have been you know a handful of years ago and um, so there's on in a normal year <laughs> so there's there's so much more um and you know there's there's so much available you know, online too from British Athletics and so on, Athletics Northern Ireland and Athletics Ireland, and um, where there are junior sections there where you can go in and see when there's camps on and things like that. Or these days, you know, there might be a few webinars or or Zooms um, uh, for younger athletes as well. So you might find that there's there are um, some things online for, for junior athletes um, and maybe some little coaching plans and things like that, which is good okay that's good that's a good answer okay that's a wrap then no more questions i've had a few more but i'm not going to take any more of your time so um i want to say thanks for watching guys and um thanks for coming on to uh, the show kerry and um i have got uh, someone else lined up in two weeks time as well but very privileged to have kerry and in two weeks time we've got another olympian in um but i won't mention who who they are just yet but thanks a lot guys and um thanks for watching